Since 1998, astronomers have known about this strange phenomena in the universe called dark energy, this weird vacuum energy that appears to be appearing in every cubic meter of space and accelerating the expansion of the universe. But nobody really knows what it is. And at the same time, there are other mysteries in astrophysics, dark matter, black holes, etc. And now a team of astronomers think they have connected the growth of supermassive black holes over time with the amount of dark energy in the universe. And if true, then these two seemingly disconnected astrophysical processes are related to one another. If true, it's a groundbreaking proposal and one which could explain a bunch of mysteries in the universe kind of all at the same time. But in the immortal words of Dr. Paul Sutter, if it's interesting, it's probably wrong. So I get into a in-depth interview with Dr. Chris Pearson, who is a researcher with RAL Space. They're just part of the international team of astronomers who have done the observations and have written the papers, the peer-reviewed papers that are proposing this link between supermassive black holes as a source of dark energy in the universe. It's, it's pretty crazy stuff. But and yet the observations are, are pretty solid. So enjoy this interview with Dr. Chris Pearson. So what what led you to decide that you wanted to track this correlation between black holes and dark energy? So it we were kind of led to this in in a in, in a roundabout way, really. We have um, our, our team has interest in both the theoretical side and the observational side. So we, the, the, it's led by the team at the University of of Hawaii with um, with um, UK collaboration on this. Um, for, from from our side, um, we had interest in galaxy evolution and how, for example, um, stars were formed in galaxies and how this uh, the star formation galaxies was also linked to the growth of black holes in galaxies over over cosmic time. And that was one of the stepping stones that led us to the, the results of the current paper, finding that, in fact, um, the way black holes grow inside um, giant galaxies it cannot be explained by the normal astrophysical processes, you know, where where black holes gobble up stars or they merge together with other black holes. And I know this is a this has been one of the big outstanding mysteries. Like every part of the story is one of the biggest outstanding mysteries in science. But this idea that that supermassive black holes get so big so quickly and the mass of the black hole seems to be correlated with the size and evolution of the of the galaxy itself. And this question, what came first, the galaxy or the or the black hole? Um, and so is this the sort of the path you were attempting to understand? Indeed, yeah, we were looking at how these things evolve with time um, and, and, and the interplay between the, the, the black holes and the galaxies themselves from the, you know, from the formation through star formation to, um, to, to, to where we see these giant galaxies at the present day where they finished all their star formation and they're now kind of like with these, these red dead galaxies in the universe. And so then how did this connect to this idea of, of dark energy? What was the sort of, you know, well, I don't know, it's like the, you got the peanut butter in my chocolate or vice versa. Yeah. Um, so, so that the whole connection came about because um, the, the results of the study showed that you know, black holes grew much faster in mass than what could just be explained by normal processes. So then you have to look around for these, these alternatives. Um, now we know that some of these, some of these theories have been around for a while, how black holes grow, for example. But the, the key point was here that saying that this growth of black holes could indeed be linked to the expansion of the universe itself. Um, there's, there's, there's solutions of Einstein's theory of gravity, for example, that these black holes are intimately coupled to the expansion of the universe. And as the universe expands, these black holes grow as well along with that. Now that's not saying that, you know, we're, we're seeing this big expansion of the black hole it, itself, but rather as as the universe expands, space and time is stretched. Um, and this is kind of like feeding this, this, this black hole growth. Now, the connection between the dark energy and the black holes is looking at just how strong this coupling between the black holes 
and universes expansion is uh, it depends on kind of like the flavor of black hole um, as to as to the strength of the coupling. And what we found was uh, when we looked at our sample of, of um, galaxies with big black holes at the center, uh, we found a very good correlation between um, the growth rate we observed and what was predicted if these black holes um, were coupled to the universe expansion with cores of effectively dark, dark energy. And so what methods did you use to actually make these measurements of your of your black holes and their galaxies? Yeah. So what we need is um, is, is is the mass of, of of the black hole, and and this this is it's it's a surprisingly um, I'm not going to say easy way to do it, but yeah, there's 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 standard ways of um, of, of doing this. Uh, for, for for example, um, you, you can look at the at, at the material around the black hole um, that's rotating around the black hole itself. Um, and by looking at the at some of the spectral lines, so for example, classic ones are hydrogen and uh, magnesium, uh, you can get an idea about how fast this matter is spinning about the black hole. And then you can do relatively straightforward physics to to connect the speed of that rotation to the actual mass at, at the at the center of the black hole. In, this, in, in very much in the same way as the speed of a satellite around a, a, right. a planet, for example. Yeah, right. Like detecting the mass of an individual object is almost impossible put something in orbit around it and boom the equations it, indeed, help you figure yeah. it out and, and we are helped that in this study we're, we're predominantly looking at these things called supermassive black holes um the, these giants at the centers of galaxies um so this this enables us to measure this effect um to relatively large distances so we're not looking at these you know the tiny black holes we, we won't be able to see them so far away right and, and what telescope did you use to make your observations of the of the black holes and, and measure the spectra? So we've used we, we've used several um, several several telescopes. In, uh, what what we've done the, these these observations are not are not new. And rather, what we've looked at are existing existing surveys. Um, and and some of these surveys, for example, were with the the Wise satellite. Now that was a that was a US um, infrared satellite that, that did an all sky survey at um, infrared wavelengths of around um, uh, five out to eight, eight micrometers or five to 25 micrometers, if I remember correctly. Um, also, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey as well, which has been around for, for years and years and years, again, covers something like um, one quarter of the sky. So they're all standard um, surveys that we used. And, and, and it's just um, you know, picking through this to find the right sort of galaxy that we wanted for our study. And so you've you've measured the mass of these black holes. You've measured the mass of the galaxies around them. How do you tie this to the dark energy measurements? So they're tied to the dark energy measurements um, in, by by looking at the the growth rate of these black holes over cosmic time. So what we did is we first of all we picked a certain type of galaxy and the certain type of galaxy we picked were these giant elliptical galaxies and giant elliptical galaxies are galaxies that have finished all their star formation um so it's, it's effectively a quiescent galaxy it's not one of these sort of like star bursting big merging ultra or hyperluminous galaxies that we see uh so so they're effectively red red dead galaxies this means that any growth of the black hole we measure is very difficult to reconcile with, with star formation because these things shouldn't have star formation in them. And we look at these different populations um, as, a, as a function of distance in the universe. So, so more distant galaxies actually being in the past are actually younger, right? It's kind of like a reverse thing when you look back, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, yeah. And, and, and we, look at, we look at galaxies, um, for example, say um, like nine, nine billion years, um, nine billion years ago, and then we step forwards at, at certain uh, slightly different distant ranges until we get to the local universe. So it kind of like gives us a map of how these these black holes have been growing uh, over time, uh, and, and we can be we, we can be relatively sure that um, that most of this is not going to be astrophysical processes. Right? It's not going to be stars forming, for example, because there's no stars um, forming in, in that galaxy. And then we can and then we can try and map that to map that growth rate to what we expect these galaxies would have in terms of growing their black holes, which is very small because they're, you know, they're, they're dead galaxies. And we find that there's something like a factor of eight to 20 bigger than what they should be if we're just considering um, uh, current theories. 
So, so that, that gives us this, this big sort of like anomaly that we have to we have to um, uh, explain. Yep. Um, and then we we make this assumption of this this fact that the black holes are coupled to the expansion universe. So this gives us a method to increase its mass. And then the, where the dark energy comes in is that um, it, it it connects the the strength of this coupling to the expansion of, of the universe and the expansion of the universe. So the, the, this um, this um, coupling can be thought of. It's a bit like an elastic band, you know, that you pull apart. And as the universe pulls apart, there's more tension in the elastic band. So there's like there's more potential energy in, in this elastic band um, as the universe expands. Um, so we c it, it's almost like to keep with the elastic band analogy, you know, the amount of tension in that elastic band uh, relates to different sources of, um, of of what the what the black holes are made of, for example. Yep. And this this tension in the elastic band is is captured in, the, in this value called the um, the coupling strength or or the or this uh, this lesser k that we use um, in in the paper. Um, so so this coupling constant, if you find a value of about three, uh, then it's consistent with with, um, with dark energy inside these black holes. Right. If, if 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 it's like uh, <laughs> I'm really trying to avoid the, the use of the word normal black hole because it's a, <laughs> to say, right. to say normal 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 black hole is, is you know yeah. in, in itself a little bit of a contradiction. But let, let, let me say traditional traditional black hole is, is, is right. a better one. So traditional black hole is this cosmological coupling strength will be zero. Right. So there's quite a difference between zero and, and three. So we can we can then measure um, this for all the galaxies in our sample. And what we find is this nice clustering um, around this value of K equals three. Um, and and, and it, it, it is quite a significant statistical result. How um, many so, sigmas? So 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 this is, is like at, at the at, at the 98 percent or 99.98 percent confidence interval here. Right. So right. It's it's um, it, it's it, in terms of the statistics, it looks very likely. And this was done. This study was done with something like 500 galaxies. It, it's right. not a small number, but it's not a large number. So there are you know caveats on this in terms of like, as usual in astronomy, it would be very nice to have a lot more um, galaxies and data to to work with. So it should be stressed. This is a very initial result. But it's it, it's initial result that has gone through the peer right. review process to be published in papers. So it's it's a really interesting um, um, starting point. Well, I want to sort of <clears throat> go back to this initial measurement of the increase of the mass of the black holes in a galaxy that is done with its star formation. So in theory, there's n there shouldn't be material feeding into these black holes anymore. And yet you're measuring an increase of the mass of the black holes without any food. That alone seems like a very interesting result. Have other people detected this in the past? Or is this sort of one of the new measurements that you're making? So it's, it's, it's not it's, it's not a particularly new measurement. Um, and, and this is a standard way of, of, of measuring the, the, the mass of, of black holes. I mean, I mean, black holes always have something going around in, in the center of the galaxies. I mean, um, e e even in our galaxy, um, we're, we're not an actively star forming galaxy uh, in, in terms of like violent star formation. Uh, but we still have stars you know, whizzing around the, our, our central uh, galaxy and we still have like this some some dust and gas around the central galaxy as well. So it's, it's a pretty standard way to measure um, the, the, the mass of these the, these black holes. So a lot of a lot of the astrophysical side is is pretty standard, pretty standard tools the, the, the jump is making the connection uh, between between the theory and the observation. And that's what's special about the result, really. Uh, even even the thing like the dark energy in black holes uh, or or vacuum energy that sometimes referred to in, in black holes. This has been knocking around since the 1960s. You know, there's been people talking about this and theorizing and finding solutions of Einstein's um, uh, equations of, of, of gravity. The significant thing is here is tying that theory to something that's actually been observed. And these observations actually fitting what the theory is is predicting. So, I mean, I mean, this is a classic correlation causation question. Like you are 99.99% .9 sure 
that the mass of the black holes are increasing in lockstep with the amount of dark energy that's making its way into the universe. That could be a coincidence, of course. Um, the the I guess the claim of the paper is that these things are causal. Yeah, yeah, and indeed we we have to be so 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 the result of the paper shows that it's that there's two things. First of all, that that the the growth of the black hole mass is consistent with being made of um, uh, vacuum energy. Yep, and then when we do a calculation, an estimation of of the total amount of vacuum energy contained inside black holes, then we find that we can actually potentially account for all the dark energy in, in the universe here. So what would it take to give yourself a much higher, I mean, 99.99%, like I think to regular audience sounds quite exciting and that sounds very certain, but as a, as a, an astronomer, uh, I'm sure you're like, oh, I, I need more sigmas, please. Like five sigma, ten, one in ten million would be nice. Um, Indeed, yeah. What would it take to pin down those uncertainties even further? So, so what what would be really nice? I think there's two ways this can be done. Uh, I mean, first of all, to um, to have more data of the same um, kind, and and that would help us basically to um, improve our statistics. But what, what would be really nice is if we can find um, evidence for this in completely different um, avenues and, and things like that would be um, um, black hole, black hole merger rates where where the effect of this may be seen, for example, in accelerated orbital decay of the black hole, black hole merger rates. And that's something that things like LIGO may be able to give us, for example, um, the gravitational wave experiment. Um, also to look at at a larger spread of, of the mass of black holes, the stellar mass black holes, for example, and look at their and, and look at the mass spectrum and see if we see an over density in the number of black holes um, um, there. Uh, and, and also, if, if if possible, if we could find even even completely different avenues for this, for example, looking at the cosmic microwave background, which is like the the afterglow of the Big Bang. Um, so you you know we, with the um, cosmic bi bi microwave background we have these nice sort of red and blue temperature maps that maps that are made quite famous by um, uh, W Map and the Planck satellite. Um, but we know that this the cosmic microwave background can also be decomposed into kind of effectively sound waves, right? And you can do this with um, like spherical harmonics. Now there might there might be a signal in that data as well um, that we that would correlate with with the result that we have, and that would be quite nice if we could find a completely different avenue to you know to, to correlate with our, our results. So it really is you know putting that question out there, and now saying um, you know let, let's go and prove or disprove it, which is you know, which is how science should be done anyway. Yeah, I mean, what about like JWST? I mean, you said it was the the images were tip traditionally done with Ys. JWST is like super wise. Would that help you get more data? It would, but the thing is that JWST, JWST is not built for um, uh, big statistical samples. It is built for looking at a at, at very in, uh, small number of very, very interesting things. So in, in this respect, um, JWST is probably not going to be the right instrument to use. I mean, what, what we really want are things like all sky, all sky surveys, for example. Right. Unless they gave it to you for a year. Right. So give it to us. Yeah, that'd be very nice, but I don't think that's good. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Okay. So, you know, like people, like I want to get into the consequences of this in a second because, because yeah. like I'm kind of holding back on this part of the interview because it's really exciting. But before we, I want to, I want everyone to eat their vegetables first before we get on to the dessert. And so, you know, you mentioned that you, you know, the job of science is to try to generally try to disprove your hypothesis. So how could you be wrong? Lots of ways we could be wrong. Um, <laughs> so so as, as, as you raised, um, that the first one is, you know, just simply a, a cosmic coincidence. Um, have we thought of everything in the in the way we work in things out in the, in the statistics? Um, have we made the right assumptions about the, the galaxies and how, how much star formation do these, these old, old galaxies have in them? The, the other big assumption is that what we'd really like to do, obviously, if, if we're looking at how 
uh, the mass of a black hole changes with time. What we'd like to do is like pick a black hole and look at how it changes over nine billion years. But that's going to take several generations of scientists, right? So, yeah. so instead, um, what what we do is is we make an assumption that these elliptical galaxies at the the distant the distant the high distances are the same population, or rather, will evolve in this in the same into the same population as what we see in the local universe. And that's a reasonable assumption in the way we think about how galaxies evolve, but it's not necessarily correct. Okay, so so that that's one area as well where we might find out that um, you know we, we were we were wrong, or you know the, there's a reduced coupling strength as well. Um, the the other thing is the, the other ways are we've used various sort of statistical methods uh, when we look at the sample to calculate the correlation of coupling strength. Um, that there's there's various assumptions made there. As I said, we've only got 500 galaxies. It's, it, it's, it's not a tiny number, but it's not a big number to do these sorts of statistics with, especially when you spread them out over the distance range um, that we have, because we're looking back over nine billion years of cosmic history, right? It's um, it's 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 no small it's no small time span to assume that things don't change. For example, right? Okay. So plenty, plenty of areas where we where we need to sort of tighten up things. I think. So, in the paper, you are not just sort of providing these observations, but you are proposing an underlying mechanism for what is the cause this coupling and. And by doing so, are proposing fairly dramatic rewrites to physics as we understand it, both in terms of dark energy, but more uh, significant is the changes to black holes themselves. Yeah. So, so if you're right and this mechanism is true, what is a black hole? Right. So this is, yeah, this is now getting into the, um, the, the, the far reaching implications. Yeah, this is the dessert portion of the, yeah. of the conversation, everybody. So, <laughs> but I, but I think it's interesting enough that, that let's just speculate and see where we go. Yeah, sure. So I, I mean, we, we probably need to take a step back first of all, then, and, you know, and, and just say what a, what, what, what a black hole is. I mean, a, a, a black hole, it happens, um, in the simplest sense where, some of the, the these massive stars um, explode at the end of their lives because because stars basically are nuclear reactors. So you've got a nuclear reactions happening in their core, and these nuclear reaction, reactions are pushing back constantly against the the pull of gravity. And gravity is trying to squash the stars the stars down. The nuclear energy is trying to push back against gravity. So for much of the star's life, you have this balance between the energy generation in the star and the gravity outside the star. Uh, when when the star runs out of energy, so it runs out of fuel rather, it can no longer convert its hydrogen to helium. Uh, gravity suddenly wins, and for big big stars who basically um, live fast, party hard, die young, their fuel disappears rather suddenly, and then we will see catastrophic collapse of the star as gravity takes over. Now the gravity will squash the star down, the star will explode in a supernova, blowing off some of its material, but the core remains and it gets squashed and squashed by gravity more and more until it gets squashed to a point where it's so dense and the gravity becomes so strong that even light rays coming out from the core uh, can't resist the pull of gravity and that's why black holes are black. Now, traditionally now, if you cross, if you could cross into a black hole without being spaghettified, um, you would make your way towards the centre, and as you go towards the centre, you would find the density increasing, the pressure increasing, and the volume getting smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to a point that we call the singularity, um, where the density would be infinite, the pressure would be infinite, and the volume would be zero. So you're squashed, you're squashed into nothingness. Now, the problem with this is, the problem with singularities is that they're a bit of a mathematical impossibility because you can't really have division by zero in the, in, in the simplest sense. It's, it's, it's a math problem. Uh, and, and it's not saying that that happens. What it's saying is that at that point, our, our understanding of the laws of physics are breaking down and you need some sort of quantum theory of um, gravity, for example. So we don't want really uh, black holes with singularities. Now, what this current study would help with is that black holes in the new scenario 
would have dark energy cores. Now that in itself is exotic, but at least it's, it, it circumvents the need for these singularities. So it would radically change the way we think black holes are structured and rather neatly also circumvent the need for singularities in black holes. So it's not the only solution for this, but it is the solution that, that we've linked to um, some degree of observational uh, evidence. So, so it would really turn black holes on their heads mm -hmm. you know, to discover if we could, if you could get around this sort of traditional structure and replace them with dark energy cores. But what, like, you say change how they would be structured, but like, what, what is a dark energy core in a black hole? Like, if you were to sort of, I don't know, slice a black hole in half, you know, before you talked about this increasing pressure and and density and temperature yeah. and and decreasing volume, what would you see now if you sliced this God, black hole absolutely. in the horizon? And th th this this is this is where we get on. This is where we get onto progressively progressively shake it shake it mm -hmm. around. Yep, you're getting to really the um the uh, the bleeding edge of um, yeah. No, but I you know we we <laughs> put all the caveats in and we made this a safe space, so it's okay so, to you know let your imagination run wild here. Yeah. And and and, and the, the the answer some of the answers are absolutely amazing. So so the idea is 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 that at, with these dark energy black holes, um, the outer layer uh, you, you you would look like a traditional black hole. Um, as we move inside the black hole, we would effectively see a phase transition. So in some ways, the same way as sort of like you know water turns to ice and vice versa we would see a phase transition from the normal matter into, into dark energy. Um, and, and this may happen at a second event horizon, a, a Cauchy horizon inside the black hole. Now, the really interesting thing is here is that inside this inner horizon, once you've got this, this vacuum energy or dark energy core, the core of a black hole actually acts like something called a de Sitter universe. Now, a de Sitter universe is one of the solutions of Einstein's theory of general relativity. And, and it was it was postulated as a universe with, with, with no normal matter, no mass inside it, but filled with just the energy of the vacuum. And, and the, the cores of these black holes would act very much like these de Sitter universes. So, so it's, it's, ra it's rather cool to think of um, um, the, these black holes almost having mini universes at, at their at their center which you know, which is which is quite a, a mind blowing um a, a mind blowing result to it which which uh, which, I, which I I personally is you know, is a really exciting thing of course there's no way there's no way we can send a probe or a telescope in, in, in to see this it's all about um um does the theory fit the observations really but it's it's a really exciting way of thinking about it though so but then how does the i guess so we you sort of described what black holes might be. So then what is dark energy under this model? So dark, so, so what, we, what we have, what we, what we've done is, is, is shown an origin for the dark energy. We haven't answered questions about what the dark energy is. Um, if we think of it as, uh, as, um, and again, I, I used, uh, I want to avoid the word normal because it's not normal the traditional um or one of the traditional interpretations is, is dark energy is, is what we call vacuum energy so vacuum energy is uh, is the energy associated associated with empty space um classically or or, or in the in, in in the in the quantum world this energy is caused by little virtual particles popping into existence and popping out of existence as well. But the, the, problem, the problem with this formulation of dark energy is, is when you come from the quantum mechanics side and you calculate the, um, the, the uh, magnitude of this dark energy, we get numbers that are something like orders of 120 orders of magnitude bigger than what we see in the universe today. So when we start talking about dark energy now, we are also starting to run, to run into problems with trying to marry Einstein's theory of gravity of the very big and the very strong sort of um, um, environments with the theory of quantum mechanics, which you know addresses the very small, which leads us on to this whole thing about things like theories of, of everything and, and unification theories. So th 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 there's lots of stuff out there, um, but we are very much in the realm of, of theory. We know there's also a time in the universe um, around the time of the Big Bang, where the universe suddenly expanded very, very fast. It's, you know, it's called the inflationary phase. 
And we think that at the end of this inflationary phase, the, the, this, this sort of vacuum energy of the universe um, was converted into the normal matter that we see today. Right? Now, inside that black hole, this phase transition between the outer part of the black hole and the inner part of the black hole could be that mechanism in reverse. So instead of converting vacuum energy into, into, um, into normal, normal stuff, you're converting normal stuff into, in, into vacuum energy. And that could be a possible mechanism with which with the way these, these cores in black holes are, these dark energy cores are, are created. But again, it's, it's, all, it's all very sort of, um, you know, hand waving and, mm-hmm, and theoretical. Mm-hmm. But I mean, again, the, the traditional view, the normal view of dark energy, that nobody has any idea what it is, um, is that it is some kind of constant pressure that is being generated by empty space itself. The more empty space you get, the more dark energy you get and the faster the universe continues to accelerate apart. But if black holes themselves are, are the source of the dark energy, then you would expect the expansion to not be homogeneous, you would expect to see giant clusters of elliptical galaxies pushing away regions of space in a way that that's uneven is would that is that what you would expect to see? That, 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 that's, that's a really good question. It's, and it's a question that, that keeps on coming up. And, and, and the answer is, is, um, is, is locked up in, in the theory of general relativity. The theory of general relativity, when it talks about these type of energy density sources, um, it, it, in fact, the actual pressure is averaged everywhere. Um, and that includes, that includes if you've got dark energy clusters inside what we call compact objects or black holes, so un, under under relativistic conditions, which black holes are in, uh, you can think of the the pressure being averaged over the entire fabric of space and time during the acceleration of the of the expanding universe. So again, when we when we think about these things, we're we're very used to thinking about black holes uh, black holes as isolated objects, uh, whereas you've got to think of them as as connected intimately to the fabric of space time um, it, itself. So the, the, these these results are tied up in the in the solutions of general relativity, and, and a bit I admit yeah, they're, they're a bit mind bending um, as as well. But we are we are in the realms where we're moving away from like Newtonian mechanics, which is common sense, and and into sort of like the the areas where you've got things like you know time dilation and you mm-hmm. know, things like this. So it's 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 it, it there are solutions to this in the in the maths. And so if you say when the Nancy Grace Roman telescope comes online and does a really detailed survey of type 1a supernova or Vera Rubin, like I think astronomers only know of about 1600 type 1a supernova right now and Vera Rubin is supposed to find a million in yeah. a couple of years. So you wouldn't expect to see the, ex- the acceleration of the universe to be different in different locations like you would expect to see it to be exactly the same no matter where yeah. you look despite the locations of the black holes themselves yeah 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 so that that's that's not a way we're going to distinguish whether this is right or wrong because we, we'd expect to see exactly to what we see now yeah, yeah. if you did find that it is <laughs> different would that disprove your work well it wouldn't disprove the work it would um it, it would probably um I mean, it, it, it would have it would have two 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 different um, implications. I think. I mean, f- first of all, that our theory of dark energy is probably not correct, uh, which wouldn't necessarily disprove what we're saying because it could be something else exotic, you know, that that is that does exist in sort of like this this clustering environment. And 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 the second thing would be that um, uh, general relativity might not be correct on those scales, for example. Mm. So, right. So. I think we'd have if 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 this new if the new generation of telescopes and facilities found something like that, we'd have a lot more to worry about than the results of this study. I think. <laughs> well, I mean, it would be exciting. It's like the you know the crisis in cosmology. Like this is just a gigantic opportunity to well, reevaluate yeah. everything we ever thought was true. Indeed, and and this is this is what we had with the with the initial discovery of dark energy. I mean, back in the nineteen nineties. Um, if, if you lived in, in, in the if you studied in the 80s or in the early 90s, you you were living in a universe that had a big bang. Um, well, and this big bang gave the universe uh, its first kick, made it expand. But then immediately gravity starts slowing the universe down. So we we lived in a universe where 
uh, the expansion was slowly slowing down and maybe actually stopped expanding at time infinity, for example, was was one was like the preferred preferred universe we lived in. Then in uh, the late 90, 1990s, I think 1998, you had Hubble looking at these distant supernova, finding their um, their brightness wasn't what was expected, and the only possible, the only plausible explanation for that was the universe was accelerating, you know, which which no one saw coming, right? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, yeah, no one ordered that. So it, it, it's always possible that you're going to get this next generation of facilities that is going to turn astronomy on its head. Even things like James Webb is looking for the first stars. If those first stars are found, for example, much further or much earlier in the history of the universe than what we expect, again, then you know, people have to think about uh, um, revisiting uh, their, their theories of how the universe evolved. So new stuff always brings new, new, um, new discoveries, really. You know, there are some possibilities that maybe dark energy is actually increasing or has changed in in up quantities over time. You know, one of the most unsettling ideas is the idea of the big rip. Do you make any predictions based on whether the universe is going to tear itself apart in a few billion years? Not a few billion years, thankfully. <laughs> um, uh, yes, so, so, so dark energy should be should be continually being created because um, it, it's 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 a property of the of, of the universe expanding, uh, but it, it's it's the it's the density of the dark energy that's the important thing. And and and, and what's happening is that the dark energy is being produced in, at the same rate as the as the universe is expanding. So you've got like this this power of free, so this cube of being pro of produced, but you've also got things being spread out at the same time um, with an equal. Um, power of cube because like the volumes expanding so the density goes down so what you effectively get is a constant energy density for dark energy now that that means that the proportion of dark energy with respect to the other stuff in the universe does change with time right so in the early universe when the universe was small the actual fraction of dark energy compared to the density in normal matter and dark matter was a lot smaller so in the early universe is dominated by by gravity. And in fact, if we made this study 10 billion years in the past, we wouldn't even we, we wouldn't be making it because dark energy wouldn't be able to be seen. We wouldn't know it existed. Yeah. Now, as as time goes on, this dark energy density is still constant. But because the universe is expanding, the density of the dark matter, the density of the normal matter is being diluted. So so now we're living in, in an era where dark energy has taken hold and is accelerating the universe. If we fast forward, you know, 25 billion years or so into the future, then the universe has got even more diluted, gravity is even more weaker, dark energy is the same, but the actual fraction of the dark energy density is now absolutely dominating the universe. You're going to get to a point where it's like 99.99% of the energy density fraction is actually in dark energy. And that's when we're going to see, you know, this, this, this big rip or rather, you know, like a cold death of the universe where the universe expands so much that the individual atoms are split up and you've got like zero energy everywhere. Um, but uh, and I did I did newspaper articles and interviews last last week for this. And um, th th there had to be a, like a, 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 a period of calming down, but it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and and changes of the copy. So don't don't panic your readership because it's not going to happen in the next um, <laughs> in, in the near future. It's, it's a long, long time. We're safe. Right, right, of course. Um, I mean, what's next? Because like, like, if you're right, this is enormous. Yeah. And and I'm sure in your mind, you're like, and so we're probably not right. Like, like, you don't want to sort of get too high in your own <laughs> supply. No, no. Um, this is a this, this could be a groundbreaking result that that rewrites big chunks of physics. Yeah really it's got to be really scary to be proposing that it ha it, it is and you know we we already get various amounts of um, of kickback from the from the cosmological community especially um yeah. everyone's got their pet theories and again like i said before this this is this is how science is supposed to work um if if we do find that these results are disproved we've still got that discrepancy right as well there's still things that need to be explained there's still there's still been a, a formulation of, of for example the origin of dark energy and the uh, and the fact that vacuum energy might exist inside these compact objects which 
like I said before, is not a new thing. There's been plenty of theories that have been that have put forward for dark energy stars or dark energy black holes as well. It's all part of the of the process of um, of pushing forward our our understanding. To, so to be to be proved wrong is 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 not a terrible it's not a terrible thing. Obviously, it's nice to be right, but um, you know, we're 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 being we're being pragmatic about it. You know, in in this case. Right. Yeah, it would be nice to be right, but you'll settle for being wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Chris, it, it is absolutely fascinating work, and and I think we're going to hear more and more about this in the coming weeks, months, and 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 years, and hopefully you do end up being proven right. Uh, if people want to chart your progress and see the work that you're doing, what's the best place to do that? Um, yeah, so so if, if you want to follow the work, uh, first of all, the papers are on the um, Astrophysics Archive, Archive site. Um, you can look at uh, things like physics, physics.org that have also reported um, the, the results of this. And as I said, the, the, the main partners in this study were University of Hawaii. So you, look, you can look on the, the astrophysics group at the University of Hawaii page as well, and, and they'll, they'll, that will put you in the right direction for the future work here. Fantastic. Well, uh, please keep us all posted on, on what you guys discover with each iteration of this research. It sounds yep. pretty exciting, and I'm really looking forward to what you uncover. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at university.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Maud Sue, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Josh Schultz, and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.